size. And then this is Thai May uh, Pao, and, or Paul, sorry. <laughs> yeah, okay. I mess it up. Um, and she goes, she can call her May, or T Paul, right? T Paul still works. Too. Yeah. <laughs> um, that was her grandpa's nickname for her. And um, she works for Amani Family Services. And she um, also is a former refugee here. In So, so um, I, first of all, I just wanted to, to thank Aaron um, for, for organizing this um, and Ryan, bo both of them from, are from PBS. Um, and then also I wanted to just thank uh, Erica Mann and, and Shannon Johnson from the library who they're co-sponsors um, for this event. Um, so we, th this is um, like, so as the, the Ken Burns documentary is uh, rolling out across the country, I believe the, the first screening started, the, I wanna say like September 18th, um, they've also been um, doing, I, I guess, promotion and publicity around the series. Um, and uh, so I actually, uh, I think Aaron and I contacted each other as a result of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Um, they've been working with PBS on promoting this series. So. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then um, I work with Amani Family Services. I'm the Outweas assistant. So um, one of my role is to go out there when this events and talk about money and give resources to the community. And then another one is I'm, I manage a short-term uh, short case management where family will come refer to us and we work with them for four months to help them get connected with community. And just uh, piggyback on what Steve is saying, um, during the uh, the beginning of September, uh, the Amani, we have a welcome fair. And one of the days where we um, honor the films and uh, the United States and the Holocaust was, uh, was promoted there. And so, yeah. Um, thank you so much. That's a great question. So um, in case you did, didn't hear all that, I think the question was, you know, given this particular history in terms of what the United States was or was not doing, you know, before the liberation of the camps, um, uh, is there something that we can, we can learn today about what's happening? Um, and, and, you know, I, I mean, I think, you know, genocide... Uh, has has had some banner years since 1945. Um, so clearly, you know, both the United States and the, the international community needs to do better in in han handling humanitarian crises. Um, so I, I mean, I think there's um, and you saw some of this in the excerpts. There's quite a bit in there about the United States policy on letting in. Um, refugees and other um, uh, uh, communities who were forcibly displaced um, from from uh, from their home, um, and if you go back and watch the entire series, you'll see there's a whole section. And there's a shout out to uh, the eugenics class that I team teach with Dr. Badia. Uh, um, uh, there's a whole section on the the, the ways in which um, uh, eugenics, sort of racial cleansing policies, helped inform United States immigration policies throughout the 1920s and 30s. Um, so, I, I mean, I think it's important to to recognize that the Holocaust did not 
um, just kind of appear magically out of the sky, um, that there were many factors that led to the Holocaust, including the American influence on Nazi, German po Nazi Germany's policies uh, uh, toward uh, race and racial purity. Um, and so I, I think one way in which we could maybe learn from the past to address our current day situation is um, to, to understand what those connections are, how things led up incrementally um, to a policy of, of forcible uh, uh, you know, dislocation and mass murder. Um, and it's not to say that every time there is an eugenics policy or every time um, there is a specific group that's targeted that it will automatically lead to genocide. But the danger is if you don't do something early that there, there, you, you are taking a huge risk. There could be you know, a human catastrophe around the corner. Um, and you know, I think again, the, I think the flip side to this is how important is um, the work of Amani um, you know, HIAS, Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, Catholic Charities, how important that work is in terms of supporting um, refugees and other immigrant communities or other communities who have been forcibly displaced, making sure that they get resettled and that they have the resources that are necessary to thrive in a community. So there's that story too, and I think we need to pay attention to that history. And for that, like, I think I'm going to defer to the expert here who can kind of talk about the work that organizations like Amani, um, uh, you know, w what they're doing and, and sort of how they serve refugee and, and other um, communities who have been forcibly displaced. So um, before I'm going to talk about Amani, I'm going to uh, share a little bit about the film uh, with my thoughts on it. So um, with the film, they was talking about part where um, these refugee, Jewish refugee was undefined and that they bring cautious, they be their, their left one hand and very cautious hand to, to help them out and then their president and everything like that. So um, I'm a former refugee, and before I was a refugee, I was a, B a Burmese and a Koran, because I have a mixed cultural, and that is my identity. So I wanted to answer your questions to, uh, the advice is that all the refugee have identity already before they were uh, identity identified as a refugee. So I encourage that um, go and encounter, when you encounter a refugee, don't be afraid to come up to, her, to us and say hi and form a conversation with us because we have a story to share. And the story that we share is not just our refugee part of the story, but our own individuality part of the story. And I believe that that's what my the Amani mission is. Um, our mission is to promote safety, encourage personal growth, and foster a spirit of belonging. And ever since I moved here, and when I started hearing about Amani, I was like, I want to be part of that, a part of a change that can make refugee feel safe and be able to thrive, while also trying to make the community not be scared to come to refugee because we're not just refugee, we're individual person with our own cultural and values and belief. So I advise that you just come to talk to us, form, um, form a conversations, and maybe we can become friends and have a lot in common. <laughs> so that's my advice. And then with Armani, we have an amazing book programs. Um, we have victim care program, substance use uh, uh, program, health uh, mental health program, and then um, prevention program. Um, and we work with immigrant and refugee community. However, even if you're not immigrant and refugee, if you come to us, we wouldn't uh, ignore you because we it's for the whole community, everyone. We welcome them. And if we can help you, we'll direct you to resources, get you started. And uh, we wanted to make sure everybody uh, feel belong, feel welcome, and grow within the community. Yeah. 
say is kind of your first experience coming here. And if you weren't, what are some things that you feel we can do better at? Mm -hmm. um, that's a good question. Um, I was about 10 or 11 when I came here in um, American. Um, I, we relocated in Atlanta, Georgia. Then back then, back in 2006, there was not a lot of uh, Burmese population, so it was hard for my family to uh, adjust. And then when we heard about Fort Wayne, Indiana, where there's have high population of Korean and Burmese, uh, we decided to move here, even though with the crazy weather. <laughs> And it was the best decision that my parents ever made, even though I was a bit upset when I was a kid, because I have to adjust to Atlanta, Georgia, and I already make friends and every, everything like that, but then I have to move to a new location and start a new, um, new group of friends. And just as the, everyone, everyone who travel and change locations struggle, I went through the same thing, but more to where I, had, I struggle with the language barrier, uh, struggle with cr identity crisis, because I'm also a Korean and a Burmese, and back home, the reason why we relocated is because the Burmese milita military wanted to take the whole country, and part of the country is there's a Korean state, and that Korean state is where I, my family belong, but we also, we live in B Burma country, but the Burmese military want the whole country to themselves. And even now, it's still going on. And so, um, even though I was strongly with everything, I didn't want to give up because this is the land of freedom. <laughs> so, I wanted to honor my parents for sacrificing to come in here because they sacrificed um, a lot for us. And I wanted to honor that. And so, um, so that, that's that. I hope I answer your questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, that I do not know, but I I know that is is go back and forth depending on the situation that's happening here. Um, before um, during the Donald Trump time. They, a lot of refugee and undocumented community have uh, they had to ship back home, and a lot of refugee who have a green card holder and they went back home to visit they couldn't come back anymore. But be, uh, the number is changing, is not standing. Yeah, um, Kathy Trady definitely will be able to answer you on that. Well, I, I mean, <clears throat> I'd, I'd have to go back and, and watch that part of the episode again, but I, I, I think once once people were here, they were here. And, uh, you know, I think the problem was that U.S. immigration quotas were so restrictive that that there were very, very few people who could, who could get in before 1945. Um, and... You know, I mean, they, you saw a little bit of that in, or uh, you saw a little bit of mention of that in um, the excerpts that that um, you know, U.S. like the public opinion was not in favor of letting in refugees to this country. So again, I think again, back to your question, things don't change that much in some ways. Um, and I just, you know, I, I wanted to. Um, uh, mention a, a, a public opinion poll. Um, if you ever get, by the way, if you ever get a chance, um, if you're in DC, you should go to the Holocaust Memorial Museum. They have an exhibit called, um, I think it's called Americans and the Holocaust. And that was the exhibition that inspired this series. And there's a lot of information in there about American public opinion during this time. 
And I, I just I want to point out, um, this is a poll that was taken in November 1938 by Gallup polls. And they asked two questions. Um, the first was, do you approve or disapprove of, of the Nazi treatment of Jews in Germany? And I'm just curious, do you, does anyone have any ideas about um, the percentage of Americans um, who disapproved? Who disapproved? Very, you think it's very low? It's actually the opposite. Ninety-four. I mean, sorry. It, it's uh, ninety-four percent of Americans disapproved. Only six percent of Americans approved of the Nazi treatment of, of Jews in Germany. But wait for it. <laughs> the second question that they asked: Should we allow a larger number of Jewish exiles from Germany to come to the United States to to live? What do you think the percentage of Americans who uh, said said yes were? Yeah, Elijah. I think much, much, much lower. Yes. So when it came to allowing Jewish refugees to come um, to uh, to the United States, only twenty one percent said yes. Seventy two percent said no. That should tell you something. <laughs> um, and, and you know it's not important to know when this poll was taken. Um, the the series mentioned Kristallnacht. Um, I don't know. Are are you all familiar with Kristallnacht? Do you know? No, some of you don't. Um, so Kristallnacht happened. I believe it was on the nights of November 9th and tenth. Um, it was a. Sorry, sorry, this went out. Um, it was a. Uh, nationally organized series of mass riots in, in which uh, many, many people were, uh, were killed, uh, the, raped, um, violence occurred, uh, destruction of property, burning of synagogues. And it was, it, it was made to appear as if it was a spontaneous uprising from the Jew from the German people when in fact it was something that was orchestrated by by the Nazis um, throughout and um, it was also widely covered in the international press there was a whole lot of exposure it was it was in some ways a turning point in terms of American public opinion about what the Nazis were doing to um, their Jewish citizens there. And this poll took place right after that. So even after all that publicity, all the news that was out there, 72% of uh, Americans said that um, Jews from Germany should not be allowed to come to the United States and live. So what he's presenting is a personal view of people just like us and what they were going through, and we can identify with it so much, and that's what's so important, because it's not just a, a bunch of faces or right. a bunch of people we don't know. We know these people, they're, hey, they're just like yeah. us. And you know, just yeah. like anybody that comes over, uh, you know, my folks came from Czechoslovakia and Poland, and uh, you know, they, they, had, you know, they weren't always well-received either, they worked in steel mills because it was jobs that were right. in Pittsburgh. And, uh, and they were uh, hard workers, but they, they, they had to live together because they couldn't speak the language. And the children who went to school taught the parents on how to speak. Mm -hmm. So I know those stories from my own personal things, and here it, it's, it's like universal when mm -hmm. you, you share, share that. So it's so important to tell your story and listen to the stories of people who come into our country 
to know their background and what, what do they go through and everything, and not just uh, you know just see a bunch of people yeah. come and go. You know, it's, it's it's the personal thing. It's an interesting uh, observation. I don't know if you caught at the beginning of the, the opening of the first episode that they actually profile a specific, specific story. I don't know if you caught that. The Anne Frank. So, uh, yeah, like what? I mean, what an interesting way to to start this. Like, it really. I mean, if there's like a single story about the Holocaust that you know the majority of people know it's it's that story they don't necessarily know the story of how Otto Frank and his family was denied entry to the US but they know the story of that family so it's sort of an interesting move to make yeah I don't know I mean if you wanted to maybe talk a little bit about kind of the present like present day stories that you've seen um, in terms of the, the communities that Amani works with or, or your, if you have a personal story Wait, can you, I don't understand the question. Oh, I just, I was wondering if, in terms of the point about, like, how important personal stories are to people, if, like, yeah, either you have a personal story that you think is important people know about you, or if, the, if there has been other personal stories that you've seen working in Amani. I, I, thought, I thought you said precedent, oh, and no, no, you no, met no. person. <laughs> <laughs> so that's another word. <laughs> um, um, so, yeah, I, I, I think it's very universal that when we when we get to when we uh, create a relationship with someone, um, we bond with them. We get to know them, and even if it's just even with um, mom and dad, or wife and husband, or children and their parents, siblings, they are related by blood, but they still go through stage with to get to know each other. So I think it's very it's universal that with others we will do the same and it's very important that we create that uh, that um, bridge between each other to get to know because there's a lot of things that you might not know about yourself that once you have a conversation with that someone that is different from you, you begin to develop your own values and you challenge your own belief and values and perspectives. And so it's very important, and especially it will challenge your prejudice and bias because um, when, when I came here, I was struggling with language. I wasn't influenced with it, and I was not influenced with it back home too. Um, my whole village called me because uh, I believe I have a, a pathological where I cannot speak fluently, even in my own language, and everybody in my village believed that I would not make it in life. But I, but because of my family's sacrifice to bring me over here, I got opportunity to finish higher education. And I finished, uh, I graduated from St. Francis with education, and now I'm working with Amani to um, provide resources for the community, um, to be out there to promote um, uh, belonging with one another and just for uh, example that even though you're a refugee uh, if you given um, opportunity you can strive just as someone who is privileged to born here and live here And with that, while you were talking, just another thought came. 
um, they were saying how um, the Jewish refugee was not bringing good into the community, but bringing, I forgot the words. So with that, um, having refugee over is um, over in the commu uh, in the country in the community. Um, it enhances your creativities because living your day to day life, you see the same face, the same uh, interests. You will want something, and every one of us is curious and love learning new things and always finding new things. And so. With refugee coming over, it's not a disadvantage, but it's adventure. Was what's like the fear cell. You get to learn a new culture, a new language, a new values, a new friends, and just open up your world. And even though you don't travel to another country, you get to experience it within your homeland. And I think that's that's a, if it's not that's a adventure and a blessing. You know, it's not a disadvantage at all. Um, I don't quite understand the questions, but um, I would say that a lot of um, majority would be uh, in poverty, but min um, minority of us are those who actually are somebody back home. They're like a doctor, a teacher, a lawyer, but when they come over here, they became a refugee and they became they had they label with a new identity that they can't be who they were back home um, and so with that they struggle to find job and because they're not accepted here with their own um, credential um, so with and with refugee where majority um, in poverty level is because they rely on their children's to get resources to get higher educations that a lot of a lot of that is a lot of pressure on the children and for children to to have to take on that responsibility even if you don't want to you naturally will do it for for my that speaking from personally I want my family to be okay so I would naturally take it and for my family to be in the poverty to for them to sacrifice for me to go to school, get a good job so I can support them and bring them out of it. That's a that's very tough, especially if you are someone who is an uh, introvert and not extrovert. And that's how I, I used to be. I was forced to be extrovert. So if if so with a money with a money family services with Hakati char charities, the, and then the um, Family service administrator; those are nonprofit organizations. Um, is a pathway for that property to decrease, I believe, personally, because <laughs> they give them resources and it helps them to feel like, okay, I I can live, and there's resources out there, and one way or another, I'm gonna get to that resource, and the people who gone through what I've gone through and will be able to provide that pathway for me. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> I, I think I want to um, try to approach your uh, question from a, a different perspective. I think it's worthwhile to take a moment to consider what a decision to completely uproot yourself and your family means, and that this is this is not a decision one takes lightly. Um, it's not a trivial decision. It means not just uprooting yourself, but uprooting your children. It means giving up whatever property you have. It means giving up your livelihood, and maybe that livelihood is like you're particularly successful in your, in your homeland. And you give all that up 
to come here for the possibility of perhaps the most menial jobs available. I think about the decisions that Jews in Germany faced in the 1930s as they tried to leave, even though the, the vast majority of countries ended up not accepting uh, German Jewish refugees into the United States um, before 1945. I think there was one country, I wanna say it's the Dominican Republic that actually accepted Jews. So people, left, people were wanting to get out of Germany not even knowing where they would end up. And I think it's also important to recognize that the decision itself to leave is agonizing. Do you perhaps wait and see if things are, get better and stay? Do you make this sort of life-altering decision you know, and that, that could potentially, uh, again, you know, m mean, you know, perhaps even risking your life and the life of your children for the possibility of leaving. You know, these were the kinds of decisions that, um, you know, German Jews Ger who had been completely assimilated within Germany, who were citizens before 1935 and the Nuremberg Laws, these were the kinds of decisions that people had to face. And there were, I, I mean, there, like families split up over this, just over the prospect of leaving. So I, I think just in terms of looking back at the history, I, I would say it, it's not a decision that, that one makes lightly. There has, there, there, there has to be dire, life-threatening forces at play to make that kind of decision. Wow. <laughs> no, you're good. Um, I was not expecting that because um, I, I believe I avoid being put in the situation where that question is uh, being asked because I consider myself not being educated when it comes to history and especially my own history. Because um, um, when I was watching the film, and seeing all these pictures and all these stories, um, I thought of my parents, could they go through that? And 
now they have the side effects of it. My parents have PTSD, and yet they still um, take care of us, and there's seven of us here. So um, that's good questions, because even though I'm not very um, strongly going out there and talking about the uh, Myanmar situations, I, in a way, slowly am doing it. And the, one of the way I'm, do, I'm doing it is I'm part of a human library organizations. And that human library is uh, located in Germany, German, in Denver. And it started in 2000. And I. <gasps> yeah? That's amazing. <laughs> yes, I actually have a call from the human library. Um, I started um, the human library. I started joining in, in 2019, and I was so nervous because, as you can tell, I'm still struggling with public speaking. But I want to share because when I come to Myanmar refugee. Um, it's, it's shining a little light on it out there. And so I wanted to be a little voice there, story, even if um, it's not gonna be a sh big thing, I wanted to just have that voice out there. So I started drawing and then I started um, doing more and, and I love it so much, I decided to be part of the leadership team and um, speak on, we actually have one more event in November and I'll share that with you. And the human library is where a uh, collaborator individual come together to share their story. So it's not just refugee or immigration immigrants. Um, there's those who go through um, go through the, uh, tough situations, just like individual of all of us: a depression, survival, rape, rape survival, disability, any kind of struggle that anyone would go through. We welcome them, and they will have a chance to share about their story and uh, challenge those who have uh, bias and um, discriminations and to unjust someone. And being refugee and hearing about this um, film is to unjust these uh, Jewish refugees, to unjust them because they're an individual who have life, who have the right to live, and because their country uh, went through things like that, that they're hoping for a neighbor country to provide them with opportunity to live. And so I um, share my story by joining Human Library and um, we've been on the news and newspapers and so slowly we're out there now in the local. However, when it comes to the civil war that is still happening now, it is now out there because the Burmese military, I believe personally, that is restricted uh, technology. And I know that the um, uh, the country neighbor uh, would, would want to be respectful to not get in it at the same time they want to. So right now, a lot of um, um, Asian Americans, youth that uh, resign, uh, that live in Washington DC are going towards politics and I admire them for the, their interest and determinations and passion for the community because I'm not gonna be able to get there but they are there now trying to put out in the world was what I hear what why so for but from local here in Foran I am putting that out there by joining Human Library and joining Armani, she just put out there. I, I think it's a really interesting question. Um, I, I wonder, and I don't know if this is what you were getting at, um, I, w I wonder if there's an effort to try to record the testimony of um, uh, Burmese refugees and make it available in the same way that Holocaust survivors have recorded their testimony. Um, I think, I know that, that, I know that that's beginning to happen. The Holocaust Memorial Museum also has an exhibit right now called Burma, the Path to Genocide, 
where they've recorded the testimony of people who have experienced the, the violence of the authoritarian military regime there. Um, and I believe that if you go to the Holocaust Museum's website, which is ushmm.org, um, you can uh, watch some of the video clips that are part of that uh, uh, exhibit, physical exhibit that's at the museum now. But again, I, I think I just wanted to underscore, and this is, comes back to something that you had said as well, like how important people's individual stories are even to just their survival. And you saw that a little bit with, in the clips with the reference to the Ringelblum archive. Um, that archive was a revolutionary um, experiment um, while under siege in the, hosti uh, in the, in the Warsaw Ghetto um, where they just collected thousands upon thousands of different artifacts of people every day. So it wasn't even just testimony. It was just like, there's a picture or here's like a news report. Um, here's someone's diary and they put it in these um, milk, milk canisters and buried them in different parts of Warsaw. They still can't find one. Like it's still, it's buried somewhere. They haven't been able to locate it. So I, I mean, it's just, it's, it's incredible the, the ways in which people really want to and need to kind of preserve their stories. Um, you know, I, I think not just for posterity, but just as a mechanism of survival. Thank you. And and I'd like to thank everyone who came out today. I'd like to um, thank thank Aaron and Ryan and and also uh, Daniel for recording the session. Thank you so much. <laughs> and of course. Uh,